Uh -huh. Okay, this last lecture cuts across the two, lecture 29 and 30. We'll bounce back and forth at least once or twice. And the uh, main topic today is something that would occur in the second half of this course if it were to be given as a uh, two. Uh, this has only happened once. Um, we hope it happens again soon. Uh, these uh, permutation tableaus and their uh, corresponding application, not just to permutation group, but to the uh, intertwining unitary group that goes with them, is uh, what I would like to show today. And I would, uh, after we've uh, gone a little bit uh, here, uh, I'd like to switch over, and before we do the, uh, the application to the molecular spectra and the molecular wave functions, uh, we'll go and look at just the atomic shell theory uh, that these tableaus makes uh, so elegantly. So uh, I'm going to uh, zip, a, zip ahead here. Uh, we've already been through uh, the discussion of the rotational energy surfaces and the clusters that come in the spectra of SF6. So one of the things that we're going to do today is go more go, go into what comes inside of those. As you see, uh, you recall, this is the, uh, I think some people would call this the Russian doll spectra. Uh, it used to be this whole thing here would be one line, and then we got to look at that much, and that was really a great breakthrough in Fourier transform spectroscopy. But then to be able to go and look, blow up by a factor of 100, uh, each one of these uh, things, uh, or at least one or two of them at first, depends on where the laser diode would land, that you, whether you'd see one or not. But uh, that uh, is a, a yet another Russian doll coming out. And then each of the uh, little uh, things there break into the cluster superfine structure. And then each one of those breaks into a hyperfine structure. And uh, we need to talk about the physics of that as well as uh, looking at uh, how the young tableaus uh, help us analyze uh, any sort of molecular spectra. So uh, that's coming uh, uh, um, in the uh, stuff below here. But before they uh, do that, uh, let's get past this business of the uh, effect of the hyperfine on uh, rho vibronic species. And uh, this is the stuff we talked about last time where we had this uh, rho vibronic species or rho vibrational species or rotational species, symmetry species that uh, were uh, like ortho and para hydrogen uh, of very constant property of the molecule that withstood uh, collisions and transitions uh, up and down uh, the ladder. So we ended up uh, separating uh, them uh, into columns that were induced representations of the correlation table between uh, the uh, O3, octagonal uh, three-dimensional group, and uh, the O2 representations, the subgroup O2 of O3. Uh, each one of these uh, species has a bunch of angular momentum states listed uh, most of the time uh, zeros, but whenever you see a non-zero number, then that means uh, that you're going to expect to see uh, that uh, uh, particular thing, like sigma u uh, plus uh, right here, uh, shows up with a 1 minus as its first uh, entry. Uh, it isn't able to make a 0 minus or a 1 plus, and uh, it does make a 1 minus according to this correlation table. So there's a powerful thing about the uh, kind of group theory that we've been learning uh, here. And a fairly simple example, but there's nothing simple about any of these molecules. They need to be treated with a lot of respect. There's a lot going on. And this was just a, an attempt to show a little bit of that uh, as far as the uh, um, physics goes. So. Um, this is from a Reviews of Modern Physics article uh, that I wrote uh, in uh, 1978, and uh, 
it's available um, on the website, I believe, and uh, so you can grab that. Uh, and uh, parts of it are in the uh, the textbooks, that both the uh, one that's online and the one that costs a thousand dollars or so. If you're uh, looking at things, so we're going to be looking at diagrams like this, but for uh, the bigger molecules, uh, particularly the uh, CF4 and SF6, uh, have uh, diagrams like that where the species, and now they're about five or six different species, and it gets very complicated for SF6. Uh, the transitions of these uh, states will only go to these states and will not uh, be talking uh, to these that belong to a different species. The uh, species that uh, has um, a bare rotor that's symmetric, that means it has a uh, spin, since this is a fermionic uh, 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 <coughs> a set of molecules, uh, it, it, the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-symmetric spin uh, anti-symmetric spin states, uh, spin a half, uh, anti-symmetrized is spin zero, so there's only one uh, of those uh, uh, hiding in that, so it's, st it's spin statistical weight is one, and um, the uh, uh, being a, a small number, it uh, corresponds to the para species of, of this uh, diatomic molecule. And then this one right here has a, a symmetric spin combination that makes a triplet, so its spin weight is three, so its lines uh, would uh, be three times higher than these, just because of three times as many of them. So there, that's the orthodox sphere. Orthodox meaning more of them, and uh, similarly for uh, that, that. So that's the sort of thing that we're going to be uh, talking about. And so far. Um, in those discussions, we really only had to know the group theory of the uh, permutation of two things. And um, that is isomorphic to our very first group, the simplest and smallest uh, symmetry group of, uh, of the whole theory here, uh, cyclic two. But now we're using this very powerful notation. It doesn't look that terribly powerful to begin with. Uh, simply re uh, replacing the letters A and B or A1 and A2 with something in a horizontal uh, array, that meaning uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric, a minus if I do a permutation uh, of 1 and 2 in a state that's written that way. So uh, the idea of this, and it's no one uh, wants to belittle the mystery that uh, is behind the fact that uh, all the Fermi nuclei are spin a half, nuclear spin, nuclear spin now, a half, and all the boson nuclei, uh, the integral uh, uh, nuclear spin, there are a lot less of these than there are of these. As it turns out, it's very easy to have a spin a half uh, in a uh, nucleus. Uh, and, and a stable nucleus. So uh, you see a great deal of, of them. Now, this is the boundary between something that looks sort of obnoxiously simple and something that's not. And that, as we pointed out when we went to work on the group C3V, that uh, we had, uh, because it doesn't commute, a good deal more work to do in order to set up all of the projection algebra. And uh, also, it's the uh, requirement that is non-commutative to have an irreducible representation with a dimension greater than one. And there was one of these E's in that. That was our first uh, encounter uh, with a, a, a multi-dimensional, two-dimensional, uh, irreducible representation. And that irreducible representation with two things has two different uh, young tableaus to go with it. And I'm using numbers here uh, to put uh, this, uh, to label uh, them. Uh, that is not the way I usually do this. Uh, what I usually do is use letters uh, to label 
uh, the actual nuclei and use numbers to label the states in which those nuclei would go. So this is just a, um, a starting uh, a starting, and, and many uh, other descriptions of young tableaus will use numbers here, but we've got this lab versus body uh, analogy here, and the um, idea is that the A, B, and C that you would label nuclei with are really not there. That is, uh, there's nobody who writes a little A on one nucleus and a B on the other one. That's totally a mathematical, uh, a temporary ruse, uh, and it's the states that we're used to having uh, dis distinct, you say. And uh, so we number the states one, two, and three, or if it's an angular momentum state, we'd go number it plus one, zero, and minus one if it was a P triplet, you see. So we're used to those kind of numbers, but the actual nuclei are supposed to be absolutely identical. You see, this is the highest symmetry in nature, is the symmetry of, say, all electrons in the universe. Doesn't matter whether they're Russian, Polish, Jewish, you name it, they're the same electrons. And this is true of other particles as well, nuclei, and finally atoms, and finally molecules if you don't have uh, something weird going on in sort of uh, a, a, nu uh, a nucleus uh, in there to distinguish it from the others. So this right here involving a bose nuclei will involve tableaus being put together that are the same. Whereas if it's fermi nuclei, the tableaus are described as spin will be conjugate, that is transposed around the diagonal that hangs down uh, in this direction uh, 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 <coughs> of the uh, tableau that represents the symmetry of the orbital parts of the, uh, of the thing. And that symmetry will correlate with uh, the uh, group that describes the symmetry of the molecule, such as uh, octahedral for SF6 and tetrahedral uh, for are uh, methane-like molecules, CF4, and, and so forth. So, Mr. Harder? The, uh, Quick question. Yes, uh, So the ABC labels you mentioned are a passive? Yes, they are. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that the particle uh, A has such and such a spin, and it also has such and such an orbit, and we're going to sum over those guys to make a state that is uh, uh, considered kosher by Fermi and Dirac, if it's a fermion, or Bose and Einstein, if it's the uh, other kind of integral spin particle, you see. So the, uh, you'll find when you read this particular uh, thing in uh, this, the missing chapters, the particular chapter 10 is devoted entirely to making, trying to make clear that. Um, the, uh, the A's, B's, and C's, uh, which label the particles, um, <clears throat> will disappear, you see, from the formalism, as, is, as they should. Now, if you somehow come up with a state that you can't tell from another one, that's pretty weird, you see, that means you, see, you better look a little closer, you see. But the actual particle, Think of it as a wave. There's a wave that's such and such a shape, and it's just exactly the same as the, uh, say, a chlorine nuclear wave would be the same. No matter where you got that chlorine moth, whether you got it at Walmart or you paid more for it at Sears, okay, it's still chlorine and it's identical to all the other chloride. Okay. Now, I actually have over in the corner there a. Uh, egg crate with particles that are labeled A, B, and C, and then the egg crate depressions are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you see. So that, that's the kind of thing uh, that this uh, text, uh, chapter 10, starts off with. And it is a little bit in the uh, chapter 1 of that same book that actually got published. Okay, now, um, once you have started building these tableaus, the next step, of course, is to put the third state, or third particle, in this case the particle C, onto the A, B, uh, that would be normally labeling those things. And uh, you see this, the, the game here is to always put uh, it on either the right or below 
imagine the tableaus are sitting in a warehouse in the corner, where the warehouse's corner is in the upper left-hand corner, and there's a wall going this way and a wall going this way. And your, your rule is that you've got to stack those boxes so they're either against this wall or against this wall or against some other boxes that you've already put in there uh, against those walls. So uh, the three can go on here, and that makes this thing. The three can go on here, that makes this thing. And the three can go on this one right here, that makes this thing. And then the three can go on the bottom of this one, that makes the most anti-symmetric uh, state. This one is just partially anti-symmetric and partially symmetric. Uh, talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, but this one is totally anti-symmetric, and we have given it an A2 notation in our old-fashioned notation here, and an A1 to this one is totally symmetric. So this is the new guy in town. This is a guy that's partially symmetric and partially anti. So his third-rank tensors uh, have uh, this kind of uh, symmetry is maybe more often than they have either totally anti-symmetry or total symmetry. So that, that's something to remember. To realize. Then as we go to fourth rank tensors or four particles, uh, four particle state uh, thing, then it's four that's going to be put on all the various positions of this so that we end up here with, um, well, five different kinds of tableaus, the totally symmetric, that's A1, the totally anti-symmetric, that's A2, and then the, the ones that are recognizing that there's some non-commutivity in this group, and there's a lot of non-commutivity in these groups. And what we're really doing when we build these things is we're building a, 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 a number theoretic structure that is pretty obvious if you write all of the elements uh, of the group as partitions of 1, 2, 3, and 4. That is, uh, the unit element, which is in a class by itself, is just 1, 2, and 3, each in their own parentheses. That does nothing. They do nothing to 1, 2, and 3, and 4, or A, B, C, and D now. Okay? But this guy right here and others like him uh, have a tricycle. A tricycle which says, take uh, uh, particle 1 and put it wherever particle 2 is, having displaced that, put particle 2 where 3 is, having displaced 3, put it, and that's the cycle, back where 1 is. So there's a tricycle, which is a little bit more complicated than, say, this one, which is two bicycles. That one's pretty obvious, and uh, you can see that there are actually three of those, uh, and they are the uh, three 180 degree rotations. Uh, when we make this uh, um, S4 here into a tetrahedron, okay? So, it's every one of these elements, all 24 of them, have a corresponding permutation, and every one of these five classes here has a corresponding partition of numbers uh, to make a, a, a class uh, of the uh, permutation group as four. Now here is just the plain bicycle by itself with three and four not being used. But of course we can have a one three and a two four and so forth. There are exactly six of these. Remember there were six elements uh, of this class right here in the uh, octahedral group. It is the same for the tetrahedral group. So um, these um, uh, these things are, are recognizable. Now, there were the 90 degree uh, elements, there were 90 degree rotations. Actually, for the tetrahedral, it's an inversion times a 90 degree. But uh, think back, these are isomorphic to O, so you can think about that group. And here it is. One goes to where two is, two goes where three was, three goes where four was, and four pops back into the, the hole left by one. Now, I would be using the letters A, B, C, and D if I were describing this the way it's written up in uh, that particular text. Okay. Now, uh, these are also all of the partitions of uh, the uh, <coughs> numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
So uh, we're getting as many partitions of boxes as we are numbers in parentheses. That's the ma matching of the, of the number of classes with the number of irreducible representations. But then when you um, sum all of the possible uh, tableaus with the various arrangements of boxes, uh, what you're getting is the sum of the dimensions, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3. Okay, that's 6 plus 4 equals 10. Okay, so there's 10. That's the rank. That's the rank of this permutation group. The 10 tableaus uh, correspond to uh, the um, 10 partitions uh, of these, uh, of these uh, and, and, and uh, numbering of these uh, uh, box arrangements. Without the numbers, there are only five kinds. There's a one-dimensional one, then another one-dimensional one, and then a doubly degenerate one right here, and then the two three-dimensional ones. The very last one that hangs down the furthest is the vector representation, T1, uh, the tensor representation, the other three by uh, three uh, representation, uh, is, uh, <clears throat> is shown right here, 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 and here. Now, the uh, subgroup chains uh, for this are very obvious. That's what's so powerful about the uh, permutational calculus. As you can see, that there's an E uh, subgroup representation uh, right there, and then this guy's going to split out and give me an A1. So I don't have to do any character analysis. I just look at these things to see uh, how the subgroup chains are uh, proportioned. Okay. So that, you know, this is, this is it's just an amazing. It is the most powerful mathematical no, uh, notation that I know of, as far as mathematical physics goes. And it's going to get power, more powerful in just a minute here, because uh, what I'd like to show you <coughs> is the uh, um, actual numbers that are important here: matrix elements and uh, characters and all that kind of stuff uh, comes of. Uh, very easily uh, uh, from this. Now, um, this is the actual correlation table for the tetrahedron, and we're going to be looking at the spectra uh, for this one. Uh, this is where I really broke it up into two um, sets, one with positive parity and one with negative parity. Now, parity uh, number, it's part of the Ro Rovibrand Rovi, well, rotational first of all, but then rovibronic uh, subspecies, the bear rotor, uh, uh, <clears throat> is determined uh, by uh, parity, is distinguished by parity. But um, what we're going to be doing is, is these are going to be our bear rotor uh, uh, numbers here, and uh, I have deleted the uh, minus signs from all of these. They should be there and the plus signs from all of these. This is a molecule uh, that when it's rotating makes wave functions of definite parity uh, very easily. And uh, that's important to, to respect. Uh, <clears throat> so the, t the characters for uh, T and O are the same. This is from that um, uh, Reviews of Modern Physics number 50 and 1978, and uh, this is a crummy way to write tableaus, but um, that's what I'm doing there, and uh, this is a much better way uh, to do it. We're going to be looking at that. Um, these are the set that correspond to uh, these five, just like it, uh, we talked about uh, in the previous uh, slide here. So we're going to be uh, taking these apart, and then and this is a really tough part of this, is we're going to look at the S6 symmetry of the octahedral species. Now, most of the S6 symmetry, that's 720 uh, group operations, uh, a heck of a lot bigger than just the uh, O symmetry operations, of which are 24, or OH, uh, that's 48. I've got uh, uh, all of the uh, OH irreducible representations of standard notation now occupying the space for subgroup. They're the subgroups now. They're the, they've got to take their place at the top of the table and we've got to look for clusters 
as we go down here. And those are clusters of, those are induced representations of this big 720 six factorial uh, group, order uh, uh, group. And if we're talking about fermions as we are with SF6, fluorine has spin a half, uh, then these are going to be the things to describe the orbital part of the uh, thing, while the conjugate, the transpose uh, tableaus are going to be describing the spins. And if the, well, most of the, uh, the, the tableaus don't get used. Anything that has uh, more than uh, two rows for spin a half uh, get X'd out. So we won't be seeing any of those uh, tableau species. We're just going to be able to work with four species for SF6. If it's S some other isotope 6, well, that's a different story. We might get to use all of them uh, if we could find something that has a spin 5 halves, 5 halves, no less. But um, that is uh, pretty hard to find. So um, later on, I want to compare uh, this spin a half case of S6 to the OH table that's on page 57 that's uh, coming up here. But I want to do the atomic stuff uh, a little bit uh, first and, and also uh, mention uh, how you uh, actually calculate some things here. Now, this is one of the formulas from this unpublished uh, chapter 10, which is sitting in the, in the folder over there. And um, we're trying to find a way to get that Xerox and put up on the, well, we'll get it Xerox so we have a paper copy, but also get it scanned so we have an electronic copy. And also, this is my job, is to completely rewrite it. It's it, a lot of things that need to be made simpler, and it also needs to be put in, um, you know, more readable type. It was literally typed, okay, t -t 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 kind of typing. No, no computer when that one was written. But in any case, uh, here is something called the Yamanushi formula for irreducible representations. Okay, for example, we, we spent a bit of work to get uh, this uh, representation, minus a half, a half, and let's see if I got that uh, right, A, B, A, C, yeah, of the uh, transposition of uh, B, C. Now I'm using the letters uh, A, B, and C here uh, uh, to uh, talk about a permutation. Uh, in, in this case, uh, B, C would be uh, uh, what we did call sigma 3 or I3, okay? Uh, remember that had trace 0 and then had a square root of 3 over 2 in both places, okay? Well, this is the formula for every uh, uh, possible uh, permutation group of the last permutation in the group, the last one, okay? The one with the highest numbers, transposition with the highest numbers. Okay. And that takes care of the, uh, the end of the permutation S in, but then it has a subgroup, right? It doesn't have N, so its uh, permutation would be N minus 1, N minus 2, okay, and so forth. And so this formula is giving you all of those, and the products of those will then generate all of the others. So this is a formula for uh, uh, basically N elements of a permutation group that will then build um, in factorial uh, elements. And this is the irreducible representation. If in the tableau n minus 1 and n are sitting over each other, you put a minus 1 on the diagonal uh, for that. And that means this, this set of tableaus are also over here. And then if they're sitting like this with n minus 1 above n, Okay, and there's a uh, distance, and you count the distance the way you count in a, in a city like New York. So many steps, so many blocks this way, so many blocks this way, and sum that up. That's the distance, digital distance, in a, a, um, a, a Cartesian city. Okay, and that becomes, in this case, uh, when you have the little one over the big one that has a minus sign, it's one over that distance. 
and that distance will be an integer. So you'll get one over a distance. And here, the distance is two. How many streets did you have to cross to go from B to C? One street, two streets, okay? That's the hook length distance. Uh, that, that uh, we were to show you show you later on that that's where we get our dimensions too. So that uh, with the thing, a small one on top, and big one uh, on bottom. Okay, like uh, that. That would be uh, <clears throat> minus a half. And then uh, right next to that will be that distance plus one. In this case, two plus one is three, and two one. 2 minus 1 is 1, so I get a square root of 3 over the distance. Okay, square root of square. Okay, so that's this guy right here, square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so you see it's, it's child's play to produce uh, the, these, these generator elements of the, of the, uh, of the group. Now the other uh, possibility is that they, the, uh, we're talking about the, the A and the B operator, A per minute, a and B operator, uh, then <clears throat> you get a plus one if they're uh, uh, this way, and you get a minus one if they're that way. Okay, so that, that's just, just a couple of examples of how this formula works. This is a more complicated uh, representation <clears throat> of the group S5. Okay, we're looking at the uh, gamma representation. It's a very funny looking gamma, okay, but that's a representation which we would uh, call 3, 1, 1. If you just read off the rows in order, uh, that's a typical way to characterize a young tableau. So here we're getting uh, these numbers uh, from this formula. Okay, so I just uh, want you to see uh, you know, something that's incredibly powerful seems really needs work. There needs to be a, a way to uh, uh, understand this better. Now this is um, the same thing, a little, little uh, very close to there, in which we calculate the dimension of each of the irreducible representations of the permutation group. And it's n factorial divided by all of the hook lengths, okay? Now, what do you mean by all of the hook lengths? Well, here's a typical one that we already know. This is the tensor representation of S4, the tetrahedral group, okay? And that's uh, S4, so I put a 4 factorial there right off the bat, and then I figure out what's the hook length. Well, starting at the edges here, we're asking how, you know, at the extremities of this city, uh, uh, how far are you, uh, you see, uh, from, you know, getting outside of the city? Well, uh, I, I am just, you know, I go uh, here, I've got a 1, and then how many, uh, how big is the hook length uh, uh, for this guy right here? It's 2, okay, and uh, this guy right here is 3, but there's this distance here now, that's uh, 4, okay, and then this one, um, he's right against the wall, and there's nothing below him, uh, that's one, okay? So then you just simply uh, write four, three, two, one, and start canceling. You cancel the four, there's no three to cancel, okay? But there is a two, I cancel that, of course the one's trivially cancel. okay? So I get three, that's, uh, what we, that's the tensor representation. And it's also true if I turn this thing on N. Now this one right here is kind of weird. It's got a hook length of three right there for that box. This one's got a hook length of two. That's only one. The ones in the lower extremities are uh, always one. And then uh, this one has, has two. Two counting two boxes to the right. And this one counting uh, what's below. So it's a sum of the box itself plus uh, each of the, counting each of the boxes to its right and any boxes below. So that is the formula for representations of the permutation group. The permutation group, uh, the symmetry group that's inside. This is like the body uh, 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 group. Then commuting with that are all of the unitary operations that put states onto these uh, bodies, these nuclei. Okay? 
It's a little bit more complicated, but not that much more complicated. The denominator is still the product of the hook lengths. Now the numerator, okay, has the, the unitary dimension, that is the size of the harmonic oscillator that's being solved here, m on the diagonal of the tableau. And this diagonal only has two boxes, so there are two m's in there. And then every uh, super diagonal goes up by one. m plus one, m plus one, and then m plus two, m plus two, if there were a box there. Okay, but there's only one. And then m3 and m4, same way, there's an m plus three and an m plus four. And there would be that in any, if this was a really big tableau, I'd have that, them on super diagonals, super, super diagonals. Okay, and then sub-diagonal, m minus one, okay, there's two of those. There's one m minus two and there's one m minus three. Okay, so that's where, where you put the numbers in, all right? Pretty easy to do. Here for this guy right here, okay, this is for u2, so I put the two right on the diagonal to start with here. And then I go up by one and I go down by one. Here for U3, I put a three on the diagonal, go up by one and go down by one. Each of them would have the hook lengths corresponding permutation group. Okay. Here's our tensor representation again, this time for the group U2. Okay. Well, it's uh, two and then it's three and then it's four and then it's one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cancel the four, cancel the two, What's left is the dimension. Remember, um, this is the uh, one of the representations of U2 that we call the vector representation. We'll be doing that. Uh, U2 means I'm putting spin up and spin down in those boxes. I have to spin up and spin down. Those cancel. So this is a symmetric representation of a, a, a product of spinners. That's the vector. That's the three. Okay. It's making any kind of sense. <laughs> it's weird, right? Very weird. I mean, when I saw, saw this, and I was lucky to see this part of it uh, fairly early, I, I take it. I, I, um, I've been arguing with Feynman, the group theory wasn't any good for anything. I said, look at this, look at this. And he still wasn't impressed because, you know, what can you do with this, right? Well, it turned out there was something you could do with it. And that was uh, just came up at, at that time was U3 cross U2 uh, to make U6, and uh, that, that you know, I, I, at that point he said you ought to go see Bill Wagner. So that's what where I wound up working for Bill Wagner, but that didn't uh, come to fruition until he moved to, to Irvine. Anyway, um, this guy right here uh, is one of the representations we'll be looking at. This is called the dike fork of U3. The but we're going to use it for the P shell of the atom, atomic P shell, which is pretty did important you, shell. Sorry, um, did you just say one more time what the hook length was? I'm not sure if I got it from the... Um, basically, any box has a hook length, and it's the number of boxes to the right of it. In this case, there's itself plus uh, to the right. So that's two this way, and then three... Uh, so this would, this would just have a three in it. But this one up here is the sum of all those boxes and, the, and all those. All the boxes to its right itself and all those below it. So the hook length is just how, how many streets you have to cross in order to get from one side going uh, to the, uh, you know, from the, wherever you are to the bottom going as far as you can this way to the wall and then now, does that make sense? Yeah, so for the example for the um, the one right above it, in the denominator, you would just count the four. Four boxes in this box's hook, only two boxes in this one's hook, and this one really doesn't have a hook at all, it's just one. Okay. Yeah, this is, it's, it's bizarre. How does that work? That's right. That it's it is really incredible. And I attempt to derive these things um, better than the derivations that you find in the literature. The ones in the literature are really terrible. Uh, this is just mildly terrible. 
but we need to improve on it. We need to, we need to find an, an intellectual lathe that turns out formulas like this. I've discovered a few of these formulas, and uh, it took a lot of trial and error uh, to do that. And that's not a good way to, to make things. Okay. Uh, professor? Here's some more examples. Yeah. You said in uh, group representation theory for physicists, uh, remember, like, the author is uh, Shane? Shane. Uh huh. Right. There, you said, like, the physics is messed up there, but the math is right? Uh, say that question again. So, like, the, the physics? Yeah, like, uh, last time I asked you what, what do you think if you would mm -hmm. recommend for further reading uh, the book? Because uh, I asked you if you have it and what you thought about it. So, would you say, like, that's a good source? Like, to you'll, you'll find uh, more on the permutation group in that book than any other I know of except ones that we put it together. Yeah, it, 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 it is good. Um, the, the trouble is that um, it's more of a mathematician's, applied mathematician's book. So, you know, what do you do with this stuff? Right, that's pretty important. And it's what drives you to develop the mathematics if you're a physicist. If you're a mathematician, you have other things that can derive it, but very often, you know, derive, I should say, drive the derivation, right? You need some, something to push the, push the frontier, right? What is it, you know? And the mathematician may be thinking of something very abstract that's powerful. Very often they're thinking of something abstract that's not powerful. Nature makes suggestions, and um, uh, the, the Chen book is weak on that. So this is a, a nicer uh, look at um, our A1, A2, and E, okay, using the hook lengths uh, that uh, go uh, with uh, these uh, things here. We're talking about S3 uh, right here. Uh, now you go down and you ask what's the uh, dimension of the unitary guys that have tableaus of a given shape. Uh, that's a whole uh, another story, but you can see that we very quickly get 1, 1, and 2. That's the dimension 1, 1, and 2 of S3, our uh, C3V group, our D3 group, okay, they're all the same uh, as far as the mathematics goes, okay. So I'm just putting all of the factorial factors up here, and then here's a, some pretty healthy hook lengths. Okay. Again, that's three, but this one's eight. I've got five here, and then I've got number three, another three right there. Okay. Now, I've got the same set of hook links down here, but now instead of putting a factorial up here, I put this crazy thing. It's sort of a factorial, but it gets truncated right there, and then I pick it up again right here, and then pick it up yet again at a smaller level, and then so on. So it's a bunch of these, but truncated ones. And the tableau tells you how to truncate them. This is called the Eightfold Way by Gil Mann. And we'll see it being applied to the atomic pea shell, which is a much simpler application and much more common. We're all made of atoms and molecules that have pea shells filled. Usually they're overfilled, right? But uh, uh, carbon, for example, uh, P2, uh, we'll look at that, and then we'll look at P3, which is nitrogen, and so forth. So, let's do that now. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, lecture 30, uh, page uh, uh, 16. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead on this screen right here. Uh, that's uh, 30 um, that uh, we've already uh, looked at a little bit. I I'm going to... Uh, go ahead and get this one uh, advanced. Actually, what I should probably do is leave some of the stuff we've already done here um, up there, namely uh, this, because I'd like, I guess, to use this screen uh, uh, for uh, what we're going to do next. So I'm going to um, escape out of this one right here, go over to uh, lecture uh, 
20, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, uh, lecture 30, okay, and we'll go forward on that. Um, let me uh, go ahead and put the view up here and get up to that uh, uh, point. So, um, it's full screen mode. And uh, we're, we're uh, looking uh, here at the tableaus that are going to, you know, be on that right there. So, let's go ahead to that point, reminding of what we've already talked a little bit about here, where we put uh, two spin a halfs together and uh, uh, built a Klepsch Gordon coefficient table the way it's usually seen in the literature. And that is uh, an anti symmetric combination of up, down, and down, up at spin a half, spin minus a half, and then you flip it and put a minus phase on it. So that's an anti symmetric state. And then the symmetric state uh, has the same z component that, that, uh, here. Uh, that's the vector. Okay. So we already see what tableau uh, the, uh, the combination of two spinners uh, are going to be. Uh, they're going to be three symmetric states and one anti-symmetric state coming out of this. You can see the power of the uh, uh, spin a half. So we've got. Uh, a vector state, up, 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 down, plus down, up, that's symmetric. You see the tableaus would be symmetric holding those uh, arrows in exactly the way that are drawn there. So they don't have boxes around them. And then this one has a minus sign on it. So that's an anti-symmetric combination of those two spin and halves. Now, we wouldn't normally talk about the symmetry that much given that we're here talking about the spin of a proton and a spin of an electron, very different particles. So their environment does not have uh, this symmetry, but their internal structure apparently does. So we are okay uh, in looking at that as a case of symmetry and anti-symmetry and uh, making use of it uh, at some point uh, here. Uh, and uh, we did discuss some of the physics of this but what I want to do is go on to the next one real quick here, and that is the table that gives us the cross of not a half cross a half, but vector cross vector, that's uh, one cross one, and uh, that gives us uh, a set of symmetric states that are even uh, total angular momentum, that's the two, and then the direct uh, sum, uh, the next in the sum is a triplet, that's vector one, 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 uh, here, and they're anti-symmetric, you see. Uh, here's 1 minus 1, and then there's minus 1, 1, the flip of that, you see, and it has a minus sign, you see, that's uh, it's anti-symmetric. But the same is true here, 1, 0 flipped to 0, 1 has a minus sign. Uh, or this one, 0 minus 1 to minus 1, 0 has a minus sign, okay? So you know, every one of these states is anti-symmetric to permutation of whatever it is that's holding these states. These are states that have numbers as opposed to A, B, C, and uh, whatever. Uh, in this case, A and B would be the permutations. And then finally, back to being symmetric again, uh, each of these, this guy and this guy uh, right here, uh, the flip, minus one and one, one minus one has got plus sign, okay? This one right here, is uh, got a minus sign, but it's zero zero, so n nothing really changed when I flip that. Okay, so th that's you know just eyeballing this uh, Gordon table here and seeing who's symmetric and who's not, who's anti-symmetric uh, for uh, the uh, the two uh, uh, factors. Okay, now if the radial quantum number was different, two and three, this is. 2, n equal 2 shell, and then there's an n equal 3 shell, electron up, uh, up to the next shell, um, and we, we uh, had the electron in that thing. This is the uh, set of states uh, that would come. We would have uh, a triplet, that's a symmetric spin, but anti-symmetric uh, 
the orbit, and then this one uh, here would be anti-symmetric spin. This is the para, this is the ortho states of those electron combinations. And uh, here I would be uh, put, putting S, P, and D. This is exactly what these are. This is S. This is the P. Remember, P stands for triplet. And then D stands for the quintet, the five states of angular momentum uh, two, the tensor, if you will, <coughs> combination. Okay. So that's the way it would be for what's called a mixed configuration in which you have different values for the radial quantum number, but if you don't, and that's what I want to show more pictures of, is the case where you have some symmetry, you have these two particles sitting where they usually are sitting, right next to each other in an energy uh, scheme. And now, and now, if you're going to have a, a, a singlet that uh, uh, means an, uh, the anti-symmetric combination of spin a half, uh, the Paris situation, can only do it with a symmetric combination of orbits so that the whole thing is anti-symmetric together. And the anti-symmetry, of course, is due to the, the spin being anti-symmetric and the orbit being symmetric. Then the opposite of that is this guy. We lose this guy and we lose that guy. They're Pauli excluded, so to speak, a Fermi Dirac Pauli excluded because uh, this is the only one that is totally anti-symmetric. There being, by being an anti-symmetric combination like this, or this, or this, of the P triplet, and I'm talking about the uh, orbital part here being anti-symmetric, but the spin part is symmetric. So again, the product of those two is totally anti-symmetric, and this one gets to stay is not excluded. This gets excluded because there we have a symmetric combination of spin with a symmetric combination of s orbitals. It's about as symmetric as you can get. That's out of here. And so is this one, which is symmetric by this table right here. Uh, it's out of here because I don't have anything in there to make it anti-symmetric uh, like Pauli, Fermi, and Dirac demand for fermions. And we're talking about electrons here. Very fermionic. Okay? Making some sense a little bit. Now, how do you say all that in tableaus? That's what we're really after here. Uh, <clears throat> the P uh, singlet got thrown out. The S triplet and the D triplet got thrown out by these Pelly Fermi uh, Dirac <laughs> uh, selection rules. Okay? And these are the tableaus that kind of tell us how that uh, all happened. Uh, I maybe come back to this basic idea, a symmetric D and S, so there are the, uh, those things. We're going to see that uh, in, a, in a slightly different context, which is in that uh, textbook. And there's the eightfold way right there, which is partially symmetric and partially anti-symmetric. Here's two cases of the P triplet, which is anti-symmetric. <clears throat> and there's just a single particle uh, uh, that doesn't have any work with the symmetry at all. So here is, using those um, tableaus, and this time it's the unitary tableaus, the ones that get to really have numbers in them instead of A, B, C, and D in this uh, particular uh, thing. And what I'm doing is I'm plotting the eigenvalue sums for both the angular momentum operator, which is called the unit vector tensor, that's, uh, uh, and I'll show pictures of the, the better pictures of the, these things and where they come from. And then this is the tensor, the uh, uh, quadrupole moment, you might say, and this is the dipole moment uh, associated with these combinations of, uh, uh, of things. And I'm putting them at, at quantized positions, so to speak, winding up uh, with this coordinate or this coordinate right here. And that is a well-known way to display the most elementary quark representation, if you're talking a high energy physicist, but it's the, uh, the P triplet of angular momentum 1, angular momentum 0, angular momentum minus 1. And this is roughly speaking linear combinations of angular momentum Z component squared. So it's so a linear direction, this is the 
quadrupolar quadratic direction. Okay. Now this particular thing has a spin, single spin, there's only one particle, so I've got spin up and spin down for each of these. So that makes a doublet, and that's what this little exponent is that's put off to the left and above uh, whatever the uh, common spectroscopic letter is for a given uh, uh, situation. So this is one particle here. Uh, that's written as P in parentheses with a 1 for an exponent. It sort of means P to the first power. Two particles is P squared. Three particles, uh, 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 this would be nitrogen. This would be, um, it comes before carbon. I can think of boron and then carbon and then nitrogen. And, and so we're, we're going down the periodic chart here. And then we come to the next, which is P uh, the fourth. And this is P to the fifth. P to the fifth, that's an almost filled P shell. Six uh, particles will finish the P shell, making argon. And uh, this is a, a argon with one hole, okay? One, one posi positive charge uh, thing. And it has the same spectroscopic designation, but a lot more particles. It's got five particles in there in these arrangements of tableaus. The high energy physicists would call this the anti-quark, and this the quark, by the way, when you flip them uh, along the odd axes, uh, you get that uh, <coughs> different diagram there. And this is the young tableau that describes the orbital part, the U3 uh, part of this uh, uh, thing. But this thing right here, the symmetric, that we uh, have already seen, uh, that's the, a combination uh, that's uh, sort of making a, a D state, that's five uh, uh, things plus one, okay? So there is a D and then an S uh, uh, hiding uh, in there. And uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, para species that is the uh, anti-symmetric uh, combinations of the spin a half uh, is, is uh, the transpose of the symmetric combinations that we get when we put the two a piece uh, together to make uh, the preceding uh, Klebsch-Gordon combination, which uh, I'll just back up here real quick. Uh, we're making uh, this D uh, state here, you say, uh, five uh, plus one. There's the other part of the symmetric combination right there. So there's the S, there's the D, we don't get any P uh, on this particular a go around here, uh, unless we're willing to use anti-symmetry. So if we make an anti-symmetric combination of the uh, a P uh, angle momentum one, that's this uh, set right there, then uh, we get this one, which goes with a symmetric combination of spins. That's a triplet. So you get a, a little three up here indicating this is a P triplet, that's a D and S singlet respectively. Now, how do you know where the energies of those things are? We'll talk a little bit about that later on, but um, obviously that's more than we can put. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to cover a whole course here in a bit, fraction of a lecture, so I apologize. Uh, please do not feel overwhelmed. Just catch what you can and then uh, uh, let's get this thing, uh, uh, if you want to, uh, follow it more uh, available. Okay, finally, the most famous of the U3 representation, or maybe the second most famous, the actual one is most famous, I think, is the decuplet, the tenfold. But this one uh, here uh, is a combination, and it's constructed just by putting ones at that level, twos at that level, and threes at that level. Okay, so you see uh, here, uh, as, I, as I come down, uh, here, the coordinates of these things are meaningful. The quadrupole linear, the linear versus quadrupole coordinates are the same. But these numbers uh, in these tableaus are definitely uh, easy to uh, assign. And uh, this particular uh, a fellow uh, turns out to have both a D and a P uh, hiding in it. And uh, that means that. Uh, uh, the, the spins, of course, have to um, give you a doublet. A doublet in the sense that when the uh, tableau that's conjugate to this, which is itself, 
self-congeate, uh, is anti-symmetric, a uh, scalar, uh, zero angular momentum. The only thing that's active in that tableau is what's uh, in the uh, right hook of it. Whereas this one down here, all the spins get to be uh, participating in, in showing their angular momentum. So this one, which is uh, totally uh, anti-symmetric, goes with a totally symmetric combination of spins in order to make a state that satisfies fermi pauli uh, Dirac. And uh, this one has a spin quartet, that's spin three halves, three times one half spins for each. And so the little four appearing here, quartet, definitely refers to that. And then the S, once again, that's angular momentum zero that you get from uh, the summation here of basically one, zero, and minus one. That's the uh, angular momentum that actually goes with one, two, and three in all of this. Then we turn the corner here, putting one more a p electron to make a shell. Now we've got four particles here. This is called the meson moplet. This is an anti-meson moplet in high energy physics. But here it's doing, once again, a singlet D and a singlet S. And then this thing is doing a triplet P, just like this. So as we come on the upper half of the, of the shell, we, it's deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra used to say. Okay, Finally ending up with one hole, one positive hole. That's uh, the notation that's used when you're talking in solid state physics where you have a zillion uh, electrons or other uh, particles uh, piling up. And uh, you have all but one uh, state filled. Okay? And if I finish this off here, I've got a singlet again. I've got a full shell. I'm talking about a, a noble uh, a nucleus, uh, an argon, uh, in that case. Okay? So th this is just to give you a feeling for how all of this works and um, how uh, m many of these you have, in this case eight, but remember how we get that eight, okay? Uh, and that's why I wanted to uh, also put that uh, over on this uh, screen here. Let's go ahead and get that uh, from the previous 29 lecture uh, that has uh, the, um, let's see if I've got, I've got this there now. Let's, uh, I guess what I, I do want to do is escape out of this one and put it on 29. That's looking like 30 right there. I'll do that real quick here. Uh, instead of 30, we want 29, and I want to view that one uh, in full screen. And uh, go ahead and get to that point, which is coming up right uh, here. Okay, so there, there are tableaus, but what I'm most interested in is this little uh, numerical uh, thing uh, here. Okay, so uh, what I'm looking at for this particular representation uh, here, I'm looking at the uh, unitary U3 dimension of that group, and I'm looking at it for a tableau that has the uh, 2 over 1 shape. So I'm using U3, I put a 3 on the diagonal, then go up by 1 and down by 1, then I put the hook lengths down there. And all there is is one lonely three. All the ones on the outer corners are one. Uh, that very nicely gives you two times four, or eight. So this is definitely uh, the eightfold way. That comes out of, um, I think, uh, James Joyce. For some reason, Gilman was uh, uh, interested in. Uh, James Joyce, and also there was something in there about three quarks for Mustard Mark, and that's where the three-dimensional representation got its, uh, gave its name quark to the fundamental excitations of high energy physics, you know, baryon uh, and meson uh, physics. Okay, now, now let's see if there's anything else that I need to um, uh, say here. Well, one, one of them is that the 
this, uh, these Klebsch Gordon coefficients or uh, Wigner coefficients are just different by a, a phase and an extra square root of the uh, summation mul mul uh, mul angular momentum. But the, the formula is derived in much of the same way that the D function uh, formula is derived. Uh, and this is in the uh, the $1,000 book. <laughs> this is uh, on uh, the uh, chapter 7 of that uh, book. <clears throat> now, um, we've already talked a little bit about uh, the uh, the uh, combination of really large angle momentums doing that funny uh, semi-classical behavior. But now what I'd like to do is just talk about putting a lot of spin product states uh, 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 together. So a half cross a half, we know that that gives uh, 0 plus 1, um, where the plus sign is that direct uh, outer, pro uh, outer uh, circle plus. And then I do uh, one more a half to make three uh, particles. Okay, so I get a one half, and then I get one cross a half. And one cross a half gives you a half and three halves. So now I've got two a halves and one three half. Okay? Two a halves and a single uh, three halves. Okay? Now the question is, as we, as we put more and more spins into something, uh, w what happens? Okay? So I want to lay those out in sort of an array that's not too different from the kind of arrays uh, that um, we just looked at, which are called weight diagrams. Um, this is a, sort of a mixture of a weight diagram and a, a correlation uh, diagram. So here I'm doing it with, with tableaus. So I've got these two boxes that contain, one's got spin one and another's got spin down. So we're talking about S equal one-half level right here. And by putting the two together symmetrically, like this, I make an S equal one, okay? A thing that was uh, called a triplet, uh, an ortho triplet, that'd be redundant, okay? Um, and then uh, the other possibility, uh, given uh, a spin up and a spin down in a, in a product, uh, is only one because there are only four, that's two squared, of these things. So I got three here and I've got uh, one there, okay? And that's the anti-symmetric one, okay? So now uh, we're going to tack on uh, another box, another box with a, a spin that can be up and down. And so that's the way we're going to build, build uh, the shell, the electronic spin part of a of a shell. It could be an atomic shell or it could be a nuclear shell uh, if it's the thing that we're building has a spin a half. Okay? So I tack on another box here. That makes spin three halves. Okay? That's this part right here. Okay? This level uh, right here. And uh, the other uh, thing that I can do is tack them on the bottom of this to make two of uh, those. I can have this one and this one, but I can't turn either one of these to uh, up from down or down from up. This is an anti-symmetric combination. It just represents zero angular momentum. It's um, canceled out, so to speak. But what's left is what's hanging there, and that's spin a half again. Okay. So here I have uh, two of these states and uh, four of those states. All right, and then the question is, uh, does that add up to two to the third? And it doesn't. So what you need to do is also put in the uh, dimension of the permutation, uh, irreducible representation, which is two there. So I, what I get there uh, is two times the two of these, which is four plus those four, and that adds up to two. Uh, uh, to uh, 8, that's 2 to the third power, uh, which is the total dimension of a third rank tensor with dimension 2. 
third rank tensor of an oscillator that only had two dimensions, okay? And then we just keep going here, building these things. And this is a picture that's in, the, uh, in that textbook, and this is the actual calculation. It goes with a typical addition of another spin to an already uh, com combined uh, 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 two-row uh, co co correction. Now, there are two numbers that are important here, and they're outlined uh, in this, okay? And that is, uh, the one we just looked at, is four is the U2 dimension for that. That's spin three halves, so a quartet, if, if you uh, use the standard spectroscopist jargon, okay? And then this particular tableau only has a dimension one for S3, very similar to the dimension of this one and this one, and in the next uh, stage here, uh, this one. So there's just one of those, all right? But there's three of those. Remember the tensor representation? Uh, for the tetrahedron, okay? And it turns out there's three of these. This is a, uh, uh, forget the uh, column there, the, the column of two, that's angle momentum zero. This is spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, and spin down, down, okay? So that's plus one, zero, minus one, that's the, uh, the dimension uh, of this, as far as U2 is concerned. Now U3 is gonna make a lot more out of that but U2 can only make three out of that shape. And then finally, this guy down here, uh, there is spin zero, that's at the uh, zero level uh, here, just like this one, okay? It's two times zeros there, but the two that we're talking about is the S4 dimension, uh, which is this one. That's the E representation of the tetrahedron being used there. So the idea, and this is shown, I think, on the next uh, picture here, is as you go through this thing, and I'm putting in blue the, the, the uh, spins that are cold, so to speak. They uh, contribute nothing. They're asleep because they're countering each other. But the active part, the red part, is the thing that determines the dimension, that is 2s plus 1, of the U2, uh, uh, unitary 2 uh, group here. Okay? So... Uh, what we're talking about uh, at, right at the end here is 2s plus 1 is 9, okay, and then the, uh, the, uh, each of these has a, a definite representation of the permutation group, only one for that, but seven for that one, and so forth. Probably better to look at some of these which we're more familiar with, but the basic idea is the product of those two numbers plus product of those two plus product of those two plus product of those two, uh, gives you 2 to the 8th, the total dimension of uh, having uh, 8 uh, of, of, of factors uh, in a combination of spins. So the, the, uh, this is a, a good thing here. Here is the, uh, the unitary multiplicity associated with the external uh, symmetry this is the multiplicity associated with the internal symmetry, and it's the product of those numbers uh, that uh, we uh, add up finally to uh, count all of the spin states for any number of spins, okay? So this would be a very precise analysis of the combinatorics of uh, just spins, that's U2, or uh, some kind of a, a tuons that's associated with a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator, you see, and that gets you into the quantum information uh, uh, theory here. So whenever you have a tableau, the number of boxes here is 2 times s, okay? So that's 2s uh, equal 4, that's the spin 4, uh, uh, is, is that right, 2s uh, <coughs> is equal to 4, uh, S is 4 over 2. So that's angular momentum 2 uh, right there. Um, <clears throat> and then angular momentum 3 halves is the next one uh, in uh, from 4, which is here, okay? Has a dimension of 4 and so forth. Okay? All right. Now, um, still got some work to do. I just wanted you to see the hook links of, uh, formula in action here. Okay. This one 
D comes out to be 14. So you can check that out pretty easily. That's just the permutational, the internal uh, symmetry uh, dimension. Uh, this guy right here, well, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't have any angular momentum, so it's a single. Your hook length formula has the product already carried out. Yes, exactly. Yep. Okay, now the rest of this, these are diagrams to explain how you make the weight diagrams uh, for these unitary groups. This is a very uh, a beautiful and uh, powerful way to display uh, these various representations that we were uh, looking at. And um, <clears throat> that is, uh, you know, very useful. But I do want to make sure that you are aware of how we generalize that spinner operator business. Remember, um, our three spinners, now these are the raising and lowering spinners, and that's the Z spinner right there with an extra normalization factor to take uh, us into this particular way of dealing with this stuff. The idea is that this guy right here, the triplet and singlet, they're analogous to uh, the ket ket uh, combinations that we did for putting together proton and electron uh, in the hydrogen hyperfine 21 centimeter uh, resonance between the singlet and the triplet. But um, this uh, is using essentially the same numbers to build this. There's the anti-symmetric combination uh, there that is required to make an angular momentum one uh, state with these phase factors, you see, and this one uh, is uh, this is a <clears throat> well. This one is the symmetric one. This one is the anti-symmetric one, just like uh, those uh, two there. And then um, <clears throat> that uh, gives us these matrices. Okay. And if you untangle them, uh, they are the Pauli spinners. Okay. Signal Z, signal Y. That was our uh, <clears throat> our crazy guy, sigma C, and then this was our uh, our bilaterally symmetric C, sigma B, and th that was the one we started with, sigma A is uh, diagonal. Okay. So th these are the spherical versus Cartesian uh, operators here, as I say, some old friends. Okay, uh, in the in this course. Okay, now the. These three operators transform like a thing. We showed that uh, when we did the, the study of our spinner operators, uh, that they would move the operator around and point it in different directions and treat it as a vector. The same thing is going to happen if you put spin one states together, spin two states, uh, spin three halves, you name the spin, it's got a tensorial set. Starts with a scalar, has a vector in the middle and then a tensor set above that. So this is a, a nice triangular formation of the, the tensor set 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2 to make those operators. Okay? This is Wigner's 3JM definition. His cousin Rock is the one that was first to build these things. I tried to generalize on uh, things. Now, the uh, TKQ operators, that's what uh, these are, either VKQ, which has got an extra 2K plus 1 factor, or this one right here, uh, which has got an extra phase, this is the TKQ definition uh, right here. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, these operators are obviously combinations of the elementary operators, A dagger A, but I'm just writing them E, M, N. Example? T21, okay? T21 is this guy right here. It's minus 1 over the square root of 2 times E12. I'm going 1, 2, 3, okay? And then plus 1 over the square root of 2 times E23. Okay, so all of those tensor operators which are responsible for the dynamics and the transitions 
of an atomic shell or a nuclear shell, all stuff works in nuclear physics too, okay, uh, all of those have, and this is something I just did by trial and error, uh, and as I say, we need better ways to do these sorts of things, but this is a tableau formula for orbital operators. For example, if I want to find the matrix elements of that between two tableaus, and I'm talking unitary tableaus right now, there's some examples. E2, 3 times that thing, so you need 1 over square root of 3, and I've destroyed a 3, created a 2, then I destroyed a 3 and created a 2 at the bottom. So this is a generalization of a harmonic oscillator, uh, raising, lowering operators, but now it works for things that have all of this wonderful symmetry. So I just wanted you to see that, just to be aware. And now let's uh, finish up by uh, going back uh, uh, to uh, lecture 29, and uh, we'll take a look at how this works for molecules as well. And we'll do this fairly quickly uh, because time is definitely running out here. So uh, let me uh, go back to 29 and uh, put that into uh, a full screen view. And we'll take a look at these two guys right here. This is that spectrum we looked at before. And these are clusters of symmetry species, making up these each one of these lines. Only right here do you get to actually see a couple of these uh, symmetry species by themselves. But now, having made a very good model for where these things are in the frequency scale, we can also make a model about how high they are. And guess how you do that? You figure out how many spin states they have. This is methane, which doesn't get to use uh, a, a tableau uh, that's that long. That, that, in other words, when we put the, the, this fermion, so I've got to put the anti-symmetric uh, spin state with this thing. Okay, and that's not going to go for CH4. CD4 is going to love it because you, you put the horizontal one for boson. So you get 15 uh, for the A1 type. Uh, levels. Uh, and here we just have an A2 to look at anyway. Now A2 here, not going to show up in CD4, but it is going to show up big time uh, for us uh, here uh, in the, uh, <coughs> uh, this, uh, this particular combination is A2, this guy right here. Okay. So things that have an A2, there's one right there, cluster A2, remember? Um, a, T, E, it's actually A, F, E, F is used to describe the uh, triple uh, representations of the um, uh, 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 tetrahedral, that's SIF4 uh, molecule. Um, th this one has a big height, okay? So it's got the height of this one plus the height of this one plus the height of that one. Those are the numbers down there, they're called statistical weights, actually they're spin weights, okay? So this guy right here uh, gets a three, this guy gets one, but actually it's two because there's plus and minus parity, and that's something you have to look at correlation table to see. So in addition to the tableau symmetry, there can be a parity uh, uh, symmetry as well. So you add all of those up, you get 10 uh, for that one. But you only get six for those, and it turns out you also get ten for that one. So th this is a good example of symmetry analysis that you get just for a few minutes' work uh, <clears throat> thing. And then this one has eight and sixteen. This is a monster here with two of those guys, and then uh, that's helping as well. Okay. So this is a hook length formula uh, at work here, and it would work not just for methane, but you name any uh, nucleus that you'd like to swing for of, and, uh, it, and just put time, find its spin and put that degeneracy right on the diagonal there and go to work with a, a multiplying uh, integers. Okay. Now this is the transition diagram, I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but the, remember these are different symmetry species according to Hertzberg, never, the, never to change, they're immutable, right? And then this is part of that whole thing, is to actually show the tableaus uh, that go with 
uh, this wind, it gets clustered. Whereas here, I use the full four uh, tableaus because here, Hertzberg's uh, right. These are good symmetry species, but they're going to mix. If you have a really tight cluster, jam these guys uh, together uh, to within a few kilohertz of each other. Then the nuclear spins say, "Hey, we're going to uh, we're going to take over this molecule." And they have a little revolution, and they break it into little uh, uh, doublets, uh, the little uh, the factor, the molecule, basically. So that's uh, something that that's happening down here. This is the, where the nuclear spins of a rotating molecule uh, become important. And uh, I'm going to uh, wind it up here by just showing you the, the weird stuff that happens with SF6. SF6 is really uh, uh, strange because if you get stuck, so you can't tunnel, you have tiny tunneling amplitudes, uh, and that's what happens in half of the, uh, uh, the spectral bands uh, for uh, these molecules. Uh, this cluster jams together, then the little spin splittings that are in with each uh, start to play. And you remember the, the, the waves that we, we calculated for uh, this cluster. Uh, well, all those are going to get jammed together and, and start mixing in, in a, a crazy way. So the, the real message I want to leave with this court, course is that the outside versus the inside, that's the uh, laboratory versus the, the body symmetry, okay, and we, we we're doing here uh, octahedral or uh, <clears throat> some subgroup of octahedral, tet tetragonal, for example, that was a majority uh, cluster species, okay. The idea is that um, instead of doing uh, an outside uh, breaking of that symmetry, which causes uh, Zeeman splitting, for example, if that was a magnetic field that you put on from, on the outside. But what if the magnetic field comes from the inside? And that's what's going to happen uh, when these nuclear spins feel that they're getting a little dizzy by rotating uh, in a molecule that has a little bit of off-center charge, has a little bit of a moment uh, to it. Okay, so at first. What you're seeing here is that uh, we get, when we do this internal symmetry reduction, is level unsplitting, the clustering, the clustering of these levels tighter and tighter uh, as we get more and more uh, uh, stuck uh, by uh, the, uh, the local symmetry. So the local symmetry uh, uh, starts to take over. Okay? Quite the opposite of what happens when you uh, make this uh, a stronger effect, the external uh, effect, which causes uh, splitting, uh, symmetry breaking. Okay. But what's really weird is that then you have to think about uh, having uh, the actual permutation group of 726 factorial play a major role. And what the, the upshot of this is that the molecule starts to take its own NMR. It takes NMR itself. It makes its own magnetic field uh, that depends on where it got stuck. And you see uh, splittings uh, due to that. Now, this is the thing that's telling you what the splittings are. Here are our uh, symmetry species that are going to get mixed. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to mix things that we normally expected to be uh, inviolable. That is the actual uh, nuclear sp total spins. Okay, those two are going to get mixed here. Um, these, uh, this guy right here, this guy right here, two, two guys that can mix. Okay, do something uh, funny, and and so forth. And um, the thing that you're not including here now is we, we have to leave those guys out if you go back and look at that uh, table that we made before. But um, here we're talking about uh, a triplet and a quintet uh, getting together and remember the conjugate that goes with that is what's going to be important or this monster right here which shows up on AT2U uh, gets to be uh, 
pre pretty uh, 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 amazing. So what, what you uh, will we'll see as we bring these two on top of each other by, 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 by clustering is when we look at it closely, either something like this, that is a, um, what we're got, what we're going to have is a, a, a triplet singlet made of quintets. Okay, here's the, the triplet and then there's an extra singlet thrown in uh, of quintets. That would occur uh, if uh, it was colder up here. In other words, if the magnetic field uh, uh, was most for that and less for these guys, or more likely the opposite situation is this one. And that's indeed what we see. So here's a typical um, look very close at the transitions that are going on here and these forbidden species, uh, SF6 species, EGTU, TBR, uh, out of here. But we do see a T2G, a TEU, and a T1U in the EGU. And because these guys have the same parity, there's actually a, a little extra resonance. And that was an amazing uh, prediction that uh, came true. That you see it in the spectrum. So it amounts to having these tableaus break up so that you've got the two that are on the, nor on the north and south pole of the molecules having very different physics than those that are on the equator, the four on the equator. So if the thing really is on a four-fold cluster, so it's like this, these guys get running into each other, go through each other, and feel a field more than the ones up here. These guys, are in a, in a, these two, correspond to those two boxes and the two spins that go with them uh, uh, are very different. So this is, this is where Hertzberg's um, predictions of inviolability of the T2Gs, the EUs, and all of that stuff, and the underlying tableaus, which he was not really that familiar with, uh, completely break up. So these are actual spectra uh, showing uh, this thing where they are on top of each other here where they've, they've come apart. This is really uh, showing very clearly that this sort of behavior uh, is happening. If you want to be impolite, uh, you say if somebody was making fun of you for, for suggesting that Hertzberg was wrong and that uh, these things would uh, come apart, uh, you have to uh, give them the what they call the middle finger salute, <laughs> right? <laughs> and T2 says, nah, -uh, we're going to break up, and that's what happens. It's all mixed up with both E and A2, and that's really uh, quite uh, uh, important. So this is just showing the mechanism of how that goes. Now, what if you had a molecule in which all of these guys were oxygens? O6 and O6. Uh, uh, 06, and it's 0616, six, so there's no spin at all. The answer is, all of these lines, hundreds of lines, vanish. There's just eight A1 singlets that remain. This is a situation that Buckyball uh, faces. Uh, it's not possible, as far as I know, to get an, uh, uh, an X06 molecule. The best we can do is f 04. Same sort of thing, but not as spectacular as this. You see. So um, the buckyball, okay, examples of Bose exclusion. That's rare. Most of the spin a half nuclei or spin one or something else. Uh, so all of these guys, including, and this would be really hard to make because there's very little 13, only 1% of natural abundance. Most of the time we're getting a um, a little less than half of the buckyballs to be C1260s, and then uh, one of them to be uh, C12 with 113 on it. The idea, very powerful here, is that the Y8 symmetry is reduced to the lowest symmetry group, a C2 group, by a single neutron. Just put one neutron on there, and you've got an address for every other atom on there, and that causes all the symmetry species that have been destroyed or forbidden to come back. That's just with one neutron. If you put uh, 13, I mean 60 neutron, uh, 60 C13s on there, okay, 
uh, you get 1.15 octillion hyperfine, superfine levels. So th this is what TC uh, was working on, uh, was uh, figuring out uh, where all those spins go. So this brings us to Buckyball, which is the end of our, uh, our course, uh, and one that uh, is really kind of neat. This is C1360, packed with spins. This is C1260, okay? C1260 at uh, the um, angular momentum. Um, this is uh, looking at J equal 100, okay? All of those clusters and things that you could get at the C13 with spin a half, if you're spinning spins a half, uh, uh, again, very rare and really hard to make. Okay, uh, unlike uh, SF6 where they're all spin a half and it's really hard to find anything that spins, spins zero, just the opposite is for this molecule. So the, um, the, the hyperfine uh, and superfine structure is incredibly uh, complex. Absolutely amazing uh, going on inside a uh, buckyball. Okay, and there's two to the 60 hyperfine levels. <clears throat> and you've basically got one to the 60, <laughs> just one hyperfine level for that. Now this is a picture of Puppy Ball that apparently uh, showed up in space. The four lines, uh, the, the, these red, are uh, there. This is the geometry of it. This is a rotational energy surface. This is a J100 uh, calculation. Uh, just to see, and you can see uh, once again uh, on the five-fold axis, we've got a healthy 30 degrees here, 31, maybe 30, almost 32 degrees. So we get a lot of the clusters that go with five-fold symmetry. Very small number, just like SF6, uh, well, for this angle right here, this is only 10 degrees, 11 degrees uh, from the separatrix to uh, these valleys. So you only get a very small number uh, of clusters. And this is 100 now, not uh, a J equal uh, 88, which is what we were looking at before. Okay, these are the actual vibrational modes, which we were very excited to see uh, in 1990. Uh, um, actually, it was uh, uh, 89. And this is uh, the fellow that really took our program and, you know, fit the spectrum, did all sorts of things that are, uh, made it possible for people to believe that this molecule actually existed. And uh, there was a model. So, there are two or three forms of carbon here on one license plate. I say there, there's also some graphite uh, on there to make the ink. But there's the diamond that the Arkansas is known for, right? That's a very symmetric form of carbon, right? Totally unstable for just four carbons. Doesn't work. It's got to be in the diamond. Diamonds are not forever. They're falling apart. But if you have a big diamond, it takes a long time, so you say four over. But uh, the C60 is, <laughs> uh, that's, the highest symmetry that three dimensions can make. So with that, uh, we end this course, and I hope you en enjoy the future as well as the past of it. Okay, so any questions that you can think of? Did the battery actually hold out? Okay, okay. still running. Yeah, this is the important one. <laughs> okay, the um, the other thing that um, you guys might be uh, interested in, um, and that's this stuff right here. Uh, there was a J mass thing that's on your that red red thing. I thought you ought to have one of these. And I'm able to give them to you since it wasn't very popular. But um, this is basically electric circuits. And the only thing that's different about this is that you have to break the modes up into 
ones that are conservative, that is to satisfy Kirchhoff's current conservation law, and the states that don't. Are they full way, full way rectifiers? Well, basically what we do here is just imagine that they oscillate. So we imagine that the uh, inductance, there's inductance on each of the, of the uh, sides of this octahedron uh, equivalently. Okay, and then uh, j j just basically making a tank circuit out of something that has a subsymmetry. So this was the first try, just to see if the mathematics would hold together. And the uh, uh, let me make this a little smaller so it's easier to uh, put it on one page here. The um, <coughs> character table for O3 uh, is there with all its glory. Um, this guy is a four-dimensional cube. And with some wrangling, I was able to figure out the character table for that uh, just based on what uh, Littlewood had done. And here are the modes. And there are the octahedral modes. Okay, good old T1G, T1U. And uh, there's an E uh, here. And uh, so these are a subgroup of symmetries that would happen if uh, you made it like that, so this guy was smaller than that guy. Uh, obviously, you, you, the idea would be to lay this out on a plane and make sure that there's no stray capacitance or inductance. That's a large order, but you, 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 you could make that. So here are the degeneracies you get for uh, that four-dimensional uh, symmetry. And here's the character table uh, for that four-dimensional symmetry right here. Wow. <laughs> I mean, there's two eight-folds, uh, two six-folds, four six-folds, a whole bunch of four-folds, two-folds, and three-folds, and finally a couple of pseudo-scalers, four of them, okay? And that, that's the O3 content right there that you see in, the, in that diagram. The Wheatstone's bridge, that's a tetrahedron. Okay, you can go from a symmetry that corresponds to S5. It's got five branches. Okay, um, There's what you would normally call a tetrahedral. Then it breaks down to S3, depending on how you arrange things and what sort of coefficients you put in. Those are the oscillator equations for the thing. And here's a characteristic of all the four-dimensional regular solids. Vertices, lines, surfaces, three volumes, four volumes, make a little table like that. This is the tetrahedron, or simplex it's called. And there's a uh, typographical error here. This is 720, not zero. But you can see that this is conjugate uh, to that one. Okay. This 24, 96, 96, 24, that's self-conjugate. Okay. But you've got a... Uh, um, You've got the, let's see if I've got another one here. I've got 8, 24, 32, 16. And then I've got going the other way, 8, 24, 32, 16. One of them's the cube, the other's the octahedron. Now after this, in five dimensions, there's only three. And that's the way it is from then on. Six dimensions, seven dimensions, eight dimensions. You're stuck with three. The simplex the cube and the octahedron, that's it. You don't get a dodecahedral giant like this uh, um, dodecahedral complex here. Uh, and it's conjugate, which is called the 600 cell. Some of these are things that uh, Chaim Goodman Strauss uh, uh, plays with. But he just makes bamboo models of them. He doesn't try to get any currents flowing in. I'm thinking of these things as, you know, little quantum circuits sometime, someday. You know, what, what could you do with something that has all of this incredible resonance, degeneracy, and then you're able to control that, you say. You're able to switch it. Do they use this? Do they ever use this kind of analysis? Like I've not seen anybody even scratch a surface on this. Like, 
the op amps that they make because I know that I don't know much about that. I know that they make them with a bunch of small transistors. And Usually two they branchers. They make very small op amps now, which are nice analog circuits. In fact, you could uh, wire up an analog computer with this symmetry uh, pretty easily rather than just put bare wires, right, hoping for the, the you know, the inductance and the capacitance just from the its shape. It's like Three-dimensional right? wheatstone rig. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's very doable. Uh, making four-dimensional things, <laughs> because just the fact that they're crushed into our three-dimensional space means they're not going to behave like four-dimensional objects unless all that counts is the current, right? The Kirchhoff laws. If that's all that counts, there's no stray inductance or capacitance, it'll behave four dimensional. But it's a tall order to get rid of the stray uh, couplings. So we've done exactly nothing with this. But it's fun. You know, it's you know I thought about it because I took uh, electronics and experimental physics. And we talk about the, that when they are reaching the limit uh, for the transistor size. Yeah. I told the professor, what about if you make a transistor about the size of an atom? Is that like right, right, right. The future, maybe. Yeah. Well, molecules uh, already have some of transistor. those properties. Yes. Like polarizability, blah blah blah, inductibility, all that kind of, of stuff, and um, that plays with the nuclear spins. Say. So basically, like the PN junctions and all of that is becoming obsolete because all this knowledge is, you know, if somebody puts that in practice, you never know. Say, you, <laughs> say, say you, you can't say values. it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this. but you can sure say it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Quantum anyway, computing. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully in our lifetime. Yeah. That would be so fun. Well, there's, there's sure been a lot of money spent on it. It's, it's one of the big rock piles that people work on, right? It's kind of like we're in a big prison and you get to work on a rock pile, right? <laughs> you know, you chip away, you chip away. High energy rock pile. Yeah. The high energy rock pile is sort of, you know, unless something happens, somebody has thinks of something, uh, it's kind of over. All those big machines, you know, um, uh, uh, some of them, like the Stanford accelerator, turned into uh, free electron lasers and are doing amazing stuff. But it's it's at the molecular level; they're not uh, trying to tear the electron apart or find a quark or anything like that. Well, why don't they do X-ray chromatography mm -hmm. at SLAP? Why don't they? I think they are sort of. Okay. It's just a question. That's something I wanted Al to, to take a look at. Sure. Germany's got a quarter on the market. Oh, their light sources are much better than ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. National light sources. Yeah. Yeah, all over the European Union. There's, just, there's one in every county. <laughs> I mean, they just spent their money on that, and that's where we go for our data. All the solid state people here, they don't you know, usually go somewhere in the United States. There's only a few light sources. But Canada has two really good ones. And they always have had something. They had Chalk River, they, they had neutron spill. They, they were the only ones that were shooting neutrons at things and getting crystal information. Strategic Yeah, they're... And um, th these uh, uh, light sources are, by comparison to the, to the Hadron Collider, they're cheap. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Orders. Yeah. Orders of magnitude, um, easier to build, operate. Yeah. But and weren't you saying that we actually kind of have our eyes set on our hopes for a tabletop linear accelerator? I don't know the status of that. It was looking like we could do that, but um, it is uh, not. Um, Actually, I should just go home and Google tabletop accelerate, see what's going yes, on. But my guess is that we would have heard about it if it was really uh, successful. Yeah. Um, Good point. It, it may be one of those things. Free electron laser for a long time was total cost. Now, it's a big deal. 
Are these original printed? Oh, yeah. I guess not. Those are original. Damn. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm really... Yeah. You know... I don't have very many originals, but this one... Uh, I, 